This program is made possible by the members of the Church Street Baptist Church in Greensboro, North Carolina. Coming up this week on Unspeakable Joy with Pastor Tyler Galden. Ladies and gentlemen, where are the people of God that say, my God, I'm not stopping, I'm not stopping, I'm going to keep on doing it. Here, if you're in that pit, if you're in that low place, and you feel like God hadn't answered, you feel like God's nowhere around, you know what you need to do? Keep on talking, keep on praying, keep on believing, keep on lifting up to God. You say, why would I do that? Is God deaf? No, 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 but sometimes we're dumb and God doesn't hold out on us so that we, so that he's mad at us to show he's mad at us. He does it so we know that he is God when everybody else has turned their back on us. The reason you keep talking to God is because he's still listening to everything you say. Amazing grace, how sweet sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught My fears relieved, how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. Cassius took half his 401k, took his health insurance, and he's still got to pay her. He's got four jobs, and he can't even run two, rub two pennies together. And you walk out of that conversation and that tongue like a razor blade has slit you left and slit you right. You know what, don't, no, 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 you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, 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 you get enough faith inside of you to pray and somebody comes along, whether they know that they're doing it or not, and before you know it, they have ripped the faith right out of your heart. Third thing that destroyed David Bible says in verse number 11, wickedness devoured him. In verse number 11, the Bible says, wickedness is in their midst thereof. Deceit and guile depart not from her streets. Ladies and gentlemen, I have been in this Christian way since I was 16 years old. I have been preaching this book since I was 18 years old. I will be 34 years old this year. So however many years that is, was that 14 years, 15 years, something like that? 18 plus 5. How long have I been doing this? 15 years? I've been doing this a long time. Say amen right there. And here's the one thing that bothers me more than any other thing that I deal with. And I think it bothers you more than anything. It's when I'm trying to live right. It's while I'm trying to live holy. It's while I'm trying to pray. And I, my entire world falls apart. My family goes to pot. My mind goes haywire. My spirit gets caved in all around me. And just about the time I try to pray about it, I look down the road at that family that drinks every beer from here to Beersheba. They live like the devil. He's cheated on her 18 times. She's cheated on him 15 times. The youngins don't want God. They cuss you and uh, horn cuss you and middle finger you every time you turn around. And yet they just got the new this. They just got the brand new that. Their family's in perfect health. Their mama's 155 years old. And they're pushing 95 years old. And here you are 35. Here you are 45. And your world's falling apart. The greatest battle that you and I have in this life, I promise you, is the prosperity of the wicked and the pain of the righteous. That is the one thing that plagued Job more than anything is why me and why not them? But ladies and gentlemen, David said, God, I'm trying everything I can. And I'm just going to be honest with you, Lord. It feels like in my soul, what's the use? 
in living for you. What's the, the use in walking in your ways? Some of you are getting in this Christian way right now and you're trying to do a couple of things. Number one, you're trying to be faithful to the house of God and you get up on Sunday morning and your kid's got a fever and your husband's puking and your TV's broke and your refrigerator dies and you say, man, this is just the devil trying to get me. Then next Sunday you wake up and guess what happens? Next Sunday when you wake up, your car battery's dead, your neighbor toilet papered your yard, your youngin' don't want to go to church this time and here's where you're at. You're saying, God, all right, two weeks in a row, I, I hope this isn't going to be a pattern for the next couple of weeks and week three week five week 10 week 18 and all the way down through week number 552 you're saying God it was never like this when I wasn't saved it wasn't like this when I was living like I wanted to live it wasn't like this when I was doing what I tried to do and you get this in your heart you say God why am I even trying to do this and what happens is the devil has almost got you where your faith is gone and that broken heart keeps you from praying. The fourth thing that just destroyed David, and this got him more than anything, in verse number 12, his friends betrayed him. Watch what he says in verse 12. He says, For it was not an enemy that reproached me. Then I could have borne it. Neither was it him that hated me that did magnify himself against me. Then... I would have hid myself from him. But watch what he says in verse 13. But it was thou, a man mine equal, my guide and mine acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together and walked into the house of God. The greatest pain in the world is when that one you love the most guts you with their actions or their words. And the broken heart keeps you from praying. How many of you have been laying by a hospital bed and you're looking and saying, God, the death of this person is absolutely gutting me. I can't, I can't take this. God, I can't handle this. It's just going to overwhelm me and I'm never going to be the same. Before you know it, that broken heart has shattered your faith. You, you say, I'm not mad at God, but it's worse than that. Because if you were mad at God, at least you'd talk to God. Then there are people that say, they say, but, uh, but I, I just have questions for God. That'd be one thing, because if you had questions for God, at least you'd be able to talk to God. But hear me, and hear me well, ladies and gentlemen. Some of the people that I'm looking at right now, you are so broken hearted, you cannot remember the last time you prayed, and you cannot remember the last time you really got a hold of heaven. Here is what I want to preach to you for just about one, or however long minutes I want to do it. Here's what I want to preach to you this morning. How do you pray when you get in that situation? What do you do when your heart is so broken? Because ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you, the further in the Christian way you get, the devil's going to try every tactic he can get to keep you from walking with God, keep you from praying, keep you from seeking the face of God. But here is what I am telling you, that the people that are broken are the ones that God desires to use the most. Do you know why? Because when a pot has a crack in it, then when the stuff is poured into it, it flows out the easiest. And the reason God has allowed you to be broken is so that what he pours in will flow out. Ladies and gentlemen, number one, what do you do when you've got a broken heart? How do you pray? Number one, in verse number 16, you ready? This is deep. Keep talking to God. Look at what it says in verse number 16. As for me, I will call upon God. Verse number 18, or verse number 17. Evening, morning, and at noon will I pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. Do you know what David realized? David realized, God, even when I'm in a storm, the winds don't keep you from hearing my voice. When I'm in the sea tossed around, the sea rolling over me doesn't keep you from hearing my voice. God, if I make my bed down in the lowest pit of hell, 
I'll look up and you'll be standing right there beside me hearing my voice. Ladies and gentlemen, if you rise up to the highest heavens, God's still going to be there. If you make your bed in the lowest hell, God is still going to be there. If you go down to the widest pit, God is still going to be there. So if God is always there, you need to make sure you keep on talking to Him. Don't let that broken heart get you thinking God doesn't care about me. Don't let that brokenness let you make, think that God isn't listening to you. You know what David said? I don't know what he meant, but here's what he said. He said, God, whether or not you're a listening, I'm going to keep on talking. Whether or not you answer, I'm going to keep on asking. Whether or not you do, I'm going to keep on bowing. Ladies and gentlemen, where is the perseverance that the people of God used to have? Where is the perseverance of our grandfathers? and grandmothers that didn't have a pot to their name. They didn't have two nickels to rub together, but they'd get down on their hands and knees and they'd say, God, I don't care about the chicken I don't have. I'm asking you for the chicken that you do have. I don't care about the cornbread not in my pan. I'm asking you to send cornbread out of your pan. I'm not worried about the eggs that aren't in my hen house. I'm begging you to hatch some chicklings in your hen house and give me scrambled eggs. Say amen right there. Ladies and gentlemen, where are the people of God that say, my God, I'm not stopping. I'm not stopping. I'm going to keep on doing. Here, if you're in that pit, if you're in that low place, and you feel like God hadn't answered, you feel like God's nowhere around, you know what you need to do? Keep on talking. Keep on praying. Keep on believing. Keep on lifting up to God. You say, why would I do that? Is God deaf? No, 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 hold out on us so that we so that he's mad at us to show he's mad at us he does it so we know that he is God when everybody else has turned their back on us the reason you keep talking to God is because he's still listening to everything you say listen to me watch this I have never stayed overnight in a hospital I don't plan to in the next little while I've never stayed overnight in a hospital. But I've been overnight in a hospital with some people. And I'm going to tell you something. Hospitals are the loneliest place in the entire world. Funeral home is probably a close second. Because not even the person in the box is there. <laughs> Hospitals are the loneliest place. I mean, you can lay there, nurses come in, nurses go out. They can talk to you, but you still feel by yourself. You're laying in that bed, you can't get comfortable. Pillows got lumps all in it. The bed's got rolls all in it. You go up and you're not comfortable. You go down and you're not comfortable. Your family leaves at 8 o'clock. Everybody goes home. You're saying, I, what am I going to do? There ain't no way I can go to sleep. You go to sleep praying God give you a good night's sleep. You wake up feeling like you've slept all night and it's only 9.15 and just an hour and 15 minutes. Listen, if you've ever been in a hospital, that's exactly what happens. You, you're all by yourself and you're all by your lonesome and you don't know who's with you. But here is what you've got to understand. You call out and you feel like God hitting around. You feel like God hitting listening to you. What you've got to understand is that in the spirit world, what happened long before you were rolled into that room is a big old God, the second person of the Trinity. He took up residence in that room knowing you'd be in that room. And you know why he posted himself in that room? Because he knew at the midnight hour you'd need somebody to talk to. You'd need somebody to pray to. You need somebody that listen and your mama won't answer your text and your daddy won't won't answer your text and your friends won't answer their phone and nobody Facebooks you and nobody tweets you and Instagrams you. What you've got to understand is God doesn't have a cell phone. He's got a direct line that rings in the throne room of heaven and he's always on time and he's always listening. So keep on talking even when you're broken. The worst thing you can do is quit praying. Perseverance will push you forward. Number two, David said in verse, in verse number 16, he said, number one, I'm going to keep on talking to the Lord. Number two, he said, when my heart is broken, I'll tell you what I'll do when I pray. I keep trusting in the Lord. Look at what he says. As for me, I'll call upon God and the Lord. Watch this. Shh. 
shall save you. He doesn't say my hope's in the Lord. He says when I call, he go answer. Listen, sometimes when we pray, nothing happens. Sometimes when we pray, God doesn't do what we want Him to do. That's true. And there's nothing we can do about that. But God will always deliver us from what is about to destroy us. Beloved, listen. That thing you went through that God didn't answer The reason he didn't answer is because somehow, in some way, there was a far greater weight of glory on down the line. I don't understand that. A preacher is a fool who says he understands. How can it be the will of God and bring glory to God to take a man in the prime of his life? How can it be to the glory of God To take a spouse just when you hit retirement. How can it be the will of God to disease our bodies? How can that be to the glory of God? I don't know. But I do know it is. Because somehow and some way... In the nether regions of glory, there is a God. Call him a chess master, call him a puppet master, call him what you will. But somehow, in some way, he is arranging the pieces of your life. And do you know what he's doing on that chessboard of your life? We think he's moving us around so the devil don't call checkmate. But you've got to understand, God is not a defensive God. God is in the offensive business. And so when he moves those chess pieces around, he's not doing it so that the devil doesn't call checkmate on us. He's moving the pieces around so that God can once again call checkmate on the devil. I have never been good at chess, but I like playing once. And that one time I played on the computer, I did it so that I was fighting myself. I said there were two players, but there was really only one player in the room, and it was, it was me. And me. And that was no fun. So I restarted real quick. And you know what I found? I'm not very good at chess, but the computer is very good. Very good. And you know what I found about that computer? That computer would let pawns and rooks, or uh, bishops rather, wrong game. Bishops. Don't let my grandma hear I play cards. Say amen right there. Is she looking, is she looking at me? Yeah, one Sunday she came. Yeah, she's been sick. No, no. And I mean that that computer, it would take out, it would take out bishops. And it would let me destroy his 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 pawns. And just when I thought I was about to win, something would pop up on the bottom of the screen. And you know what it would say? Check. And I thought, no. So you know what I did? I just moved my king. And he would move a few more times. And I'd go after another rook. I'd go or pawn. Pawn. We didn't even play cards. We didn't even have cards. And I'd go after the pawns. I'd go after his bishops. I'd go after the ones that go sideways. And I mean, I'd knock them out. And the next time I looked in the bottom of that screen, it said, Checkmate! And I thought, I'm taking out everything around theirs. And he's done got me beat. You know why? I was playing the short game. And he was playing the long game. 
Ladies and gentlemen, what you've got to understand is when you lay a loved one in the grave, that's the short game. I know it feels like forever. I know it feels like there is no hope. But what you've got to realize is God is playing the short game. And God didn't have you say goodbye. He just had you say goodnight. And I'll see you again in the morning time. Ladies and gentlemen, God's playing the long game. And the devil's on your life. And he's picking off your bishops. And he's picking off your pawns. And he's picking off your rooks too. I mean, he's picking you off every which way and you know what you don't realize is one day when you stand in the presence of God and you get a look at that old booger your adversary the devil you're going to look him square in the eyes with your family and friends united and you know what you're going to say you're going to say devil checkmate baby you know why because God was moving things all around you while you thought he was taking things he was just really repositioning your life so that you could get the ultimate glory to Jesus Christ through what was happening all around you that's why when you pray you say thy kingdom come and thy will be done here's the third one I'm done I'm closing my Bible when I say this Verse number 18, verse number 16, you keep talking to the Lord when you've got a broken heart. Number two, you keep trusting the Lord when you have a broken heart. And verse number 18, keep holding on to your brothers when you have a broken heart. Verse 18, watch what it says. He hath delivered my soul in peace from the battle that was against me. For there were many, what does that say, with me. You know the one scheme of the devil above all of the other schemes of the devil is to bring division in the midst of your brokenness so that we begin to separate ourselves from those people that are on the battle lines with us. We get mad at this person. We get mad at that person. We get mad at that family member. We get mad at that spouse. And we're just pawns of the devil. Because what we don't realize is he is separating so he can conquer. Listen. I am not somebody that prays well. I want to be somebody that prays well. I try to be somebody that prays well, but I fail so often. I go to bed more times at night feeling like I failed God more times than I go to bed feeling like I made God happy. I go to bed at night feeling like I could have done better a whole lot more than the days I go to bed feeling like I've done enough. But every now and again, I'll go to bed and I'll say, God, I feel like I've pleased you today. I feel like I've prayed like you wanted me to today. And those days are good. How many of you have had those days? You say, God, I felt, I felt good today. I felt like I honored you today. All right, three people. I'm glad the rest of you really need to hear me on what I'm getting ready to say. <laughs> How many of you feel that you've had a good day? You know, you feel like you've honored God. There is something wrong with that back section right there. I'm not sure what is wrong, but right back there, I call that my delinquent section. Right back there. The cow fees and the curtain, the, I, all that section right back there. Um, but then there are a lot of days... I go to bed, and I feel like I just have failed you, God. I just failed you. God, I just, I just flopped. And I'll be laying there in my bed, and I got my lip poked out, and I'm pouting, and I'm afraid, and I'm upset, and I get a text message from somebody. And it said, Tyler, I just want to tell you, you mean the world to me. Tyler, you mean the world to me. And you're a blessing to me. And you know what I've just done? I just got me my link back. Because when I'm low, he's high. And when I'm high, he's low. So you know what the devil wants to do? He wants to tear the bond. He wants to bring division. 
so that we'll separate in the battle. Okay? I'll be back. He knows that when Sunday morning rolls around, I've got to, got to have my mind straight. I've got to have my, my thoughts straight. I've got to be in harmony with the Holy Ghost. So you know what he does? Them shorts I left out last night or this morning whenever I changed out of for some reason, they just bother you this morning. I can't explain it. And then on Wednesday night, you know, he knows we're going to come in here and pray. But we've got to be in lockstep with the Holy Spirit and one another. So you know what he does? That makeup that you just can't help but leave on my side. <laughs> Just absolutely grates on my ever loving nerves. You know why? Because he knows the power of a link. Here's what he'll do. He'll come into the house of God. And he knows if we're together. But if we can get with him. But if he can drive a wedge between this. And guess what happens when he's walking in lockstep with us. And we're walking in lockstep with him. Now wait a second. He's walking in lockstep with somebody else. Who's he walking in lockstep with? And now we're walking in lockstep. Go this way. But wait a second. They're laboring in the church too. And guess who they're walking in lockstep with? And because he's in lockstep with him, and he's in lockstep with him, and he's in lockstep with him, you understand what I'm saying here? Because they're all in lockstep. How many of you have got somebody in your life? Come on, boys. Come on, boys. We're in lockstep. Come on. Come on, Altamura. Come on, you. Get Brianna, 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 go, go, go. Come on. Justin, come here. Come here, hon. Yes, sir. Right here, baby. Right here, baby. Okay? Now watch this. Look at the, the, the sheer numbers of people standing here. So watch what the devil will do. He'll bring a piddly little nothing that gets in the crack of your broken heart and he'll break you right there. And now the strength that we have was just cut in half. The reason he magnifies it is because if he can keep it broken, he knows we'll never win. You understand the power? staying in lockstep with your brothers and sisters in Christ that's the power of praying